so we're in a series called Building Your Altar, and uh, we're in week two. And last week, we asked four questions. Do you remember the four questions? It's from Timothy Keller, the late Timothy Keller's book on prayer, intimacy with the Lord. He asks us four questions to orientate ourselves with regards to our worship with the Lord. How do we build altars? He says, are you sailing? Are you rowing? Are you drifting? Or are you sinking? Are you sailing? Is the wind at your back? Is your sails open? It feels like the Lord's behind you. It feels like you can hear His voice and you just know His presence and you can see life change happening in and through you. Are you rowing? Are you moving in the right direction, but you're putting a lot of your strength into it? It feels more like a duty than a delight. So you're not conceding to the circumstance. You are moving forward, but it takes a lot of your strength to move forward. Are you drifting? Have you abdicated any kind of ownership of moving forward? You're just tired. You've taken your hands off the oars and just allowing circumstance to take you where it wills as opposed to where he wills. Or are you sinking? And I believe that if you're sinking tonight, uh, you can reach out to the Lord. I do want to be honest. It did take me a lot of self-control not to crack this joke that I'm about to crack last week, but I'm going to bring it in this week because it's a new week. Amen. I don't know if you guys remember this old, it's an old advert. It's about, uh, well, actually, I actually don't know, don't know what it's about, but it's very funny. So the advert wasn't effective, but it was sort of, because I remember what it's about. I just don't remember what it's about. And, uh, and, it's, and, and it comes in on the radio and says, Mayday, 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 we're going down. We're going down. We are sinking. We are sinking. And the guy on the, the intercom answers, this is the German Coast Guard. What are you thinking about? You're sinking, but what are you thinking about? You keep on sinking. It's terrible, hey? I thought that was a phenomenal marketing strategy. Uh, I think I watched it like five years, 10 years ago. I don't even know. I was 16 years old. And so uh, it just gets me every time. Are you sailing? Are you rowing? Are you drifting? Or are you sinking? <laughs> it's awesome. I felt as we were worshiping tonight, the Spirit of the living God speaking to my heart that there's some people here tonight that need to stand and not bend your knee to your circumstance. Do you know that our knees are precious? Our knees are holy. Some of your knees need replacing, but... (laughs) Sorry, Nick, I don't want to... Did you know your, your knees are sacred? They should only be bent to the King of Kings. The Lord treats your knees as holy and set apart. Your knees are actually reserved for the King of kings. I just felt in worship tonight. I want to remind someone tonight. Don't concede to your circumstance. Don't concede to your situation. Don't bend the knee to anyone else other than the king of kings. Don't concede. Don't roll back. You've got to be like Daniel. You've got to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Say, even if I'm on the fire, that's okay. I'm not going to bend my knee. I only bend my knee to the Lord. My knees are reserved. They're taken. I give my knees to the king. I just felt to encourage you with that tonight. I springboard scriptures, Romans chapter 12, from verse 1. It says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies. It's volunteering. I volunteer my body. I volunteer my life. Jesus voluntarily gave his life for you. That's why we voluntarily give our lives to him. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Let's continue to read. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. In other words, there's a pattern of this world and there's a pattern of heaven. It's not whether if you will conform to a pattern, it's which com- pattern will you conform to? The pattern of heaven or the pattern of earth? It says don't conform to the patterns of this world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind to think differently. Then you'll be able to test and approve what's God's will. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Anyone here this evening want to land in His good, perfect, pleasing will? Raise your hand. Lord, if they're not raising their hands, I'll take this. Amen, amen, amen. I want to land in His good, perfect, and pleasing will. Listen, I want my children to land in His good, perfect, and pleasing will. I want my neighbors to land in His good, perfect, and pleasing I want our nation to land in His good, perfect, and pleasing will. That's where we land, but that's not where it begins. It begins by offering yourself as a sacrifice. Wholeheartedly. Not part of you, not most of you. All of you. And when you lay yourself on the altar of the Lord saying, Lord, you died for me. I choose to live for you, not most of me, but all of me. The Bible says, as you do that and renew your mind, then you'll be able to test. In other words, discern. Is this of the Lord? Is this of the world? Is this of the enemy? Or this is of me? If it's of the Lord, then I'll be able to discern what His good, perfect, and pleasing will is for my life. So I want us to pray tonight. Invite the Holy Spirit 
give him access and authority to speak to you this evening, to speak to you in a, the innermost place, behind the mask, behind the business. You just open your heart and your mind tonight to receive God's word by faith. You'd run with what he reveals. Lord, we love you and we honor you. We thank you, Jesus, that in this place you are king, you are Lord, you reign, and where you are present, darkness is absent. I lift anyone before you right now, God, that feels a bit anxious or worrisome, burden overwhelmed. Thank you that you have not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Lord, we give ourselves to you right now, and we receive your word by faith, and we know that it's alive and active. Even after we leave this place, it's still going to be working in our lives, renewing our mind. Jesus, we bend our knee to no one else but to you. You alone are worthy because you are the only one who died to save us. You're the only one who can redeem us. There is no other name that man can be saved but the name of Jesus. And so it's at that name that we bend our knee. Our knees are reserved for the King of Kings. Speak clearly, speak mightily, speak accurately, Lord. Your children are listening. We pray this all in your precious name. God's people said, amen, amen. Now, words build worlds. Let's say that together. Words build worlds. Words build worlds. Okay, one, two, three. Words build worlds. It's a bit of a tongue twister, but it's okay. I've done it a couple times today, so I'll be fine. I don't know about you guys. But words build worlds. You can ask any sociologist or anthropologist. If, you, if you're studying culture of people, the way that you study a culture, a huge propagator of culture, carrier of culture, are the words they use every single day. Now, the reason why I highlight this point is because I believe our words are powerful. The words can affirm or break down strongholds in your life. You can either come into agreement with the lies of the enemy or come into the agreement of the truth of your father. And your words do that. And, and so words are very powerful. Speaking of words, when I say the word worship, if we were to close our eyes and the word worship, and I said, what do you picture when I say the word worship? You'd probably picture, probably a large majority of us would picture this picture over here. You can see my head over there. It's bald, but we trust in God. There will be spikes next year. Amen. It's part of my miracle offering. I'm going to put it in my envelope. Lord, we thank you for that. And all God's people said, there we go. And, uh, but if I had said the word worship, you close your eyes and I say the word worship, you would probably largely, the majority of us would picture something like that. Singing out to the Lord. Now church, that is not incorrect. That is only incomplete. That is only one aspect of worship. That's just a narrow way of thinking. And I think if the enemy can get us to narrow our way of worship, then the rest of it is secular and this is sacred. But there is no secular and sacred. It's all sacred to the Lord. Everything is worship to God. So you're on your way to work and you get a phone call, obviously, that you don't answer with your hands. You answer Bluetooth, amen, because we never on our phones while we drive. Just there. there are traffic cops in our, in our church. And I actually said that this morning. And he said, you know what? I appreciate that. <laughs> I was like, you know what? I appreciate you. And my license plate registration, should you ever come up on your... Anyway, I'm joking. So you answer the phone and they say, where are you off to? You say... Well, I'm off to worship. Oh, you're off to church. No, 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 I'm off to work because it's all worship. I know it sounds a bit extreme, but we need to broaden the horizon of what worship truly is. Work is worship. Your family is worship. Your marriage is worship. Raising your children is worship. How you handle your finance is worship. What you don't do and what you do, it's, listen, it's all worship. It's all worship for the king. Now, worship is defined as ascribing worth or honor to something or someone. It's not if you worship, it's what you worship or who you worship rather. It's all worship. And you and I need to decide whether we will just keep worship as singing or our lifestyle will be worship, an altar of worship. What changes singing into worship is the direction to whom it is being sung, the direction to whom it is being ascribed to. What changes your work just from a place where you go and you work and receive a salary into worship is the reason why you go to work. The Bible says in Colossians 3.23, do all things unto the Lord as if you're working for God. It becomes worship when you say, I'm working for the Lord. I'm singing for the Lord. Some of you don't need to sing in the shower. You guys should just actually be still. I know that, I know that the Lord doesn't want you to gift you like he doesn't want you to sing. One of the prayer requests said, Lord, I pray for a, a soundproof shower. But I just, I just think that was, that, was, um, that was just Lindsay being funny. But anyway, your husband's singing. I'm teasing Nick. He beat me in a workout two weeks in a row. Anyway, just publicly confessing there. It's all worship. Building an altar is not on a Sunday morning program, Sunday evening program, or Wednesday night program. Building an altar is a way of life. We were created to worship the Lord. It's all worship. So I can ascribe my energy, my focus towards the King, and it becomes worship 
to our Lord. Now, we cannot worship without mentioning obedience. Obedience is the highest form of worship. This is a true and proper worship the Bible describes us. It's the catalyst that brings God's presence into our singing, into our working, and into our lives. The question is not, how does this bless my life? The question is, how does this bless the Lord? That's what makes worship so powerful. And so we're going to look at an account in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 15. And this account talks about detailed obedience. Now, as a, as a leadership of the church, this is what we pray for you behind your back. I'm just going to let you know what we do. We get a word from the Lord for the year. We marry that with the vision of the house. We are changed lives, changing lives. Everyone say that. Change lives, changing lives. We marry that with the vision of the house. And we ask ourselves this, this question. Self, how do we lead our church to see that word overflow materialize in their personal lives? Like, how do I, how do we help you as a family of faith land with overflowing joy and hope and peace as you trust in the Lord that you might be filled with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit? How do we land there? And then we, that's where we want to go. And then we reverse it. What do we need to put, what seed do we need to put in place in your life to see that harvest come to pass? Does that make sense? We ask ourselves, how do we land there? And I believe the next step for our church to see overflow in this year, in your in your life, materialize is detailed obedience. Like specific obedience to the voice of God, leaning into his presence, what he has for us. And so this account, 1 Samuel chapter 15, speaks about detailed obedience. We see Samuel, the prophet, instructs King Saul, the first king of the children of Jerusalem. And he tells him that this is what the Lord wants. He wants to remove the wicked and evil Amalekites who uh, would infect nations with their idolism and uh, their this, this worship of idols. And he says, I want you to remove them from the face of the planet. I want you to remove their harvest and their livestock. We pick up from verse 8. It says, so he took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive. And all his people he totally destroyed with a sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of his sheep and cattle and the fat calves and lambs. Everything that was good he spared. They were unwilling to destroy completely. But everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. Now, notice the instruction wasn't to differentiate between what, we, what he thought was good and what God thought was bad and then only keep the good. He said, remove it all. I think sometimes we can cherry pick our journey with Jesus. Well, this is of the Lord and this is not of the Lord. But God's saying, give me not most of you, all of you. We can't cherry pick our faith with the Lord. We can't be a fully devoted follower of Christ. I think what happens is a lot of us want the, the full benefit with partial commitment. We want to have the full fruit of being a follower of Jesus and the full presence of being a fully devoted follower of Christ, but we don't want to be fully devoted. So what we do is we settle to eat off the fruits of other people's lives. We settle and we, and we should come together like this and inspire each other's faith, but not live in a space where I'm always borrowing someone else's oil. I'm always eating someone else's fruit. No, 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 friend, God has more for you. He wants you to produce your own fruit. He wants you to have your own oil. He wants you to be prepared with the presence of God because it only becomes powerful when it becomes personal. When it's my Lord, this is my book. This is the God. This is the love letter the Lord wrote to me. That's when it becomes personal. That's when it becomes powerful. And you and I need to bear our own fruit and understand that the Lord is asking for all of us. Continues to say from verse 10, then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I ever made Saul king because he turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry and he cried out to the Lord all night. He says, early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told that Saul had gone to Carmel. There he was to set up a monument in his own honor. How crazy is that? God gives him the assignment. God gives him the resource. God gives him the victory. He takes the glory. It's like, Lord, if you give me that job, I promise you, Lord, I'm gonna, I'm gonna honor you, serve you, and let me use it. Look what I've done. Lord, if you get me into that uni, if you just, if you just sort that out, then, and then we get into uni, we don't have any time for the Lord. It's like we ascribe it to ourselves when it all came from God. You're with me this evening. God gave him the victory, and he built a monument in his own honor. He has turned and gone to Gilgal. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, the Lord bless you. And he said, God bless you. The Lord bless you. I've carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, what then is the bleating of sheep in my ears? What is the lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul answered, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They were spared the best of the sheep and the cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but we totally destroyed the rest. That wasn't God's instruction. Samuel continues to speak, and he says, why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of God? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on a mission. The Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag the king, 
The soldiers took the sheep and the cattle from the plunder, the best of what is devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. Samuel says in verse 19, he says, But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. To heed is better than the fat of rams. What's he saying here? He's saying that the assignment was never to take out the Amalekites. That was just the object. The assignment was always to follow the voice of God. I want to tell you tonight that the assignment in your life is not to do the thing that God's asked you to do. That is the assignment, but that's just the forward assignment. The actual assignment is will you follow the voice of God to the end? Will you follow God's instruction right to the very end? What's God asking you to do? What's your next step? That's the actual assignment that's on our lives. Will we follow the voice of God? Will we worship God in obedience, not just with voice, not just with lip service, but with deed and with our lives? I've come to find that there's three reasons, many more, but I'm just going to highlight three reasons why sometimes I haven't followed God's voice in my life. The first one is the lack of trust. Do we really believe that God's got this? Like, if I follow what God's actually asked me to do, do I really believe that the, the king of heaven's armies, that the hosts, that the one who created everything has got my back, that he truly has what, it, what he says he has and do what he says he'll do? If I don't, then I have a lack of trust, and I'll, I'll step back in my obedience. Like, do I truly believe that 90% blessed is better than 100% cursed? Do I truly believe in honoring the Lord in purity in relationships where his design is actually better than my ways? His design is better than my desires. Do I truly believe that? When I don't, that's revol- that sort of exposes a lack of trust. But I want to remind you that our God is faithful. His score is still 100. He's never let anyone down. His word is true. It never comes back empty. It never returns void. It accomplishes every single task for which he sends. We can trust the Lord. He's not a man that he should lie. And so if he says he's going to do something, I promise you the Lord will do it. He's never not done it. In fact, he cannot not do it. He cannot not fulfill a promise. He cannot lie. We don't fully obey the instructions of the Lord because sometimes we lack a bit of trust. It's a lack of trust. Secondly, it's an abundance of fear. In verse 24, it says, Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. Because of his fear of man... He gave in and didn't follow the instructions of God. We can, that can be so many different scenarios. What are they going to think? What are they going to say? What are, no, 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 no. I want to encourage you. Live for an audience of one. At the end of the day, each one of us will stand alone in front of the Lord, and he will give, ask us to give an account of what we did with our lives. In the pre-service prayer, in our pump meeting, I love it. Sky gave a great example of this long string. We know it well. And just a small end of it represents our lives. The rest of it is eternity. And how sometimes we sacrifice the small bit, and or we forego the, the big bit, and then we keep the small bit, and we think that's the lion's share. No, 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 that's what the enemy wants you to think. The lion's share is eternity. This is but a drop in the bucket compared to what God has for us. And so we fear man instead of having faith in God, and we step back in obedience. It's the lack of trust, abundance of fear. Or lastly, I've seen when we focus on what instead of who. Let me explain. See, Saul, uh, Saul misses it. He thinks it's the what he's obedient with that, that brings the blessing. But the power doesn't lie in what you're obedient with. The power lies in who you're obedient to. Now, my boy, Zach, he's sitting in the front row over here, and uh, he's got a lot of chores. Shame, you've got to pray for him. After the service, we'll just have a prayer meeting. you just got to pray for him. He's got a lot of chores. He's got lots of chores at home. So it's, it's cleaning up after the dog. It's, it's taking out the trash. It's bringing in the black bin. It's cleaning the pool. Shame, he's just actually 24-7. I just whip him. I sort of just sit and just watch him work and... I love you, boy. But Zach's destiny is not attached to what he's obedient with. The blessing comes in who he's obedient to. Because cleaning up after the dogs, the dogs don't have any power to bless him. But who, come on now. But who he's obedient to, I've got power to bless him. I want to encourage you. Stop cursing your job. Stop cursing your job. It's not what you're obedient with, it's who you're obedient to. God's given you that place. He's put it in your hands. Be obedient to him and he can be a blessing. He can bring blessing on your life. Stop cursing your season. Say, Lord, this is what's in my hands right now. It's not maybe what I want to be obedient with, but it's who I'm being obedient to that ushers in God's blessing on your life. Does it make sense, everybody? You might think, geez, this is not much in my hands, but I promise you, when you're faithful with little, the Bible says, he will give you more. It's not what you're obedient with. It's who you're obedient to. Whose voice are you following? Lack trust, abundance of fear, or you're focusing too much. You're like, this doesn't look like much. But I promise you, little is much in the hands of God. Who you're obedient to 
is what brings the blessing. And so we're going to land in a couple moments. But before we do, I want to teach you where we receive instruction from. In His Word, in His Spirit, and in His people. This is where we receive instruction from the Lord. In His Word. You can't get around it. You can't dance around it. You can't, you can't put glitter on it. You can't know God's will unless you study God's Word. You have to study the Word of God. And the way you do that, you can do that with, Zach's actually going to go do a chore now. Shame. I've reminded him now that he actually needs to go do some more chores. Um, love you, boy. He, he went to nationals for wrestling, so I'm actually a bit afraid of him. But I won't, I won't tell him I'm afraid of him. I actually only train to stay stronger than my son. That's the only reason why I, train. I just want to, that's the only reason why I train hard, because I just got to let him know that this, anyway. God's word is the map for your future. You can't find your destiny without studying his word. So whether you've got to do an audio book, whether you've got to do it in a small group, whether you've got to read an online uh, a journal or an online devotional, or whether you read the Bible old school like I do in print, you've got to get the word God's word in because you'll never know his will unless you study his word. You have to study his word. That's why we do it in night college. That's why we do it in small group. We help us foster a culture of studying God's word. We learn his instruction through his word. We learn the instruction through his spirit. This is through prayer. We've taught our children from a young age to hear the voice of God. Listen, one of the greatest gifts you can ever teach your children is to discern the voice of the Lord, to discern the Spirit of God, to discern when God's in it and when God's not in it. So we tell Zach and Izzy, if you step into a room, you walk into a situation, a place, and you feel like it's not okay here, it's probably the Holy Spirit saying you shouldn't be there. You shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be looking at that. You shouldn't be speaking like that. You shouldn't, because the Holy Spirit, and we foster the voice of the Holy Spirit. And then we ask them, how was your day? Yeah, it was good. Did the Holy Spirit, and I ask them the question, did the Holy Spirit speak to you today, my boy? Did the Holy Spirit speak to you? Isabel's in grade one. I, I speak because she doesn't get baby Holy Spirit. Our view kids don't get baby Holy Spirit. They get the full Holy Spirit. And I ask them, did, did the Holy Spirit speak to you today? Isabel's um, writing, a, she's writing songs. And just before now, she was writing a new song. It's awesome, a worship song. She's like, and you take this part, and you take this part, and you put it together, and we love the Lord. And she's got all the TikTok dancers. She's popping and locking. Obviously, she's not on TikTok. I'm just saying, you know, there's great wine. She's not on TikTok. But she's got this, and she's going to write songs. She's, Dad, I think I'm going to write songs for Jesus. I'm going to be a worship leader. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. What's the Holy Spirit speaking to you about? Saying, Dad, I think the Holy Spirit said you must give me more money. I said, that's not the Spirit of God. I said, I'll bind that Spirit right now. Come on, let's just break bread together. We're going to fast for three weeks. We're gonna, I, don't, I don't believe that's the I'm listening to you. This is my job, the the Spirit of God. But the best gift you can give your children, your loved ones, your home, your community of faith, is to help identify and follow the voice of God, the Spirit of God. You know how you do that? When you give your heart to Jesus, the Bible says you become a temple of the Holy Spirit. In the morning, wake up and just acknowledge His presence. Say, good morning, Holy Spirit. I thank you that you're with me today. Holy Spirit, I give you access and then I give you authority. There's no point in Him giving access and then you don't follow His authority. Then you're just asking Him to follow you instead of you follow Him. But if you give Him access, Lord, work within me and then give Him authority. Lord, you are above me. When He works within you, His hand comes upon you. And everyone wants the hand of God in their life. And so... We discern his instruction through the word. We discern his instruction through the Holy Spirit. And then we discern his instruction through God's people. You know, the Christianity is a team sport. It's by design, not preference. It's by design and not preference. It's not like, oh, it's my preference to be part of a small group or church. No, no, no. It's actually part of God's design. In the early church, they met in small groups and in big groups every single day week. This is how God made us. It's a team sport. And so I've received, actually my best decisions have been made on the counsel of others. Can I just encourage somebody here tonight, not to inform your spiritual leader, your view group leader, your team leader about a decision that you've made and say, I'm inviting your counsel, but you've already made the decision. But to really invite them as early as possible into the journey, because their job is not to do anything other than help you take your next step in the Lord. And so this is our heart. Our heart is to help you discern God's voice in your life. But it doesn't happen in isolation. It happens in community. We're better together. That's why we talk about growth track team and groups. It's not because we just want you to go through a course and join a small group and go through. No, no, no. It's because then you're around God's people and they can discern God's will and they can help you take next steps. That's awesome. I I connected with three people this week. I connected with uh, a lady that's 94 years old in January. Shock. She's bucket though, eh? She's scarp. <laughs> we went to go break. She can't get to church that often. So we went to go break bread with her in her home this week. 
Myself and my mom went to go pray with her, and it's just awesome. She got a great dog named Cindy. I love Cindy, actually. <laughs> pray for Cindy as well. <laughs> Take Cindy home with me. She's awesome. But we went to go pray together, and she was just asking me for some counsel. She says, Dina, I feel like I'm in the waiting room right now. The Lord needs to take me home. <laughs> and she said, you know, and like she can't get to church, so we're breaking bread together. But I don't know why the Lord hasn't taken me yet. I feel like I'm in the waiting room. So I said, okay, well, maybe God's got some, he's got an assignment in your life that is complete. Can you think of an assignment that God has in your life? I thought about it. You know that my youngest nephew, he's 73 years old. <laughs> I'm not joking. You can't make... <laughs> His name's Brian. My youngest nephew. He lives up in Saldana. This is this. She's, she's 94 soon. 93 and a half, as she says. She says, the reason why I think the Lord is keeping me is because Brian doesn't know the Lord yet. And I'm going to pray until I see him come to the Lord. And I said, okay, we're going to pray together now. And we all stood in agreement. So we said, we're going to pray for Uncle Brian. So we prayed. Well, she just calls him Brian. I call him uncle. I said, like, we're going to pray for Uncle Brian now and stand in agreement that you're going to get a phone call. And when you do, Uncle Brian's like, you won't believe it. Apparently, he's been very resistant to the gospel his whole life. But we're going to pray for Uncle Brian. And that's maybe that she invited counsel. And now, I promise you, you could see the lights. No, this is why the Lord is here. Because I have an assignment. I'm going to pray for Brian's salvation. And I'm not going to go home until he gives his heart to Jesus. It's amazing. I saw a couple after church this morning. They're thinking about next steps and what God wants to do and move them into a different nation, all these type of good things. They're inviting counsel. They haven't made decisions saying, this is what we're thinking. What do you think? I say, okay, that's awesome. Let's pray about it. What are the next steps? What do you feel God's called you to? These kind of people, that kind of name, all these things. I want to encourage you. You discern God's instruction through his word, through his spirit, and through his people. It's powerful doing life together. Three reasons why we don't fully obey is maybe because of a lack of trust, abundance of fear. Or when we think what we have is not good enough, it's who we are obeying that actually brings the blessing. So what we're going to do now is we're going to watch a short clip, maybe two, three hours long. And uh, I'm reading this book called The Intentional Father by John Tyson. It's a phenomenal book. It is directed towards fathers and, and taking care and actually raising sons, but it's actually applicable across the board. It's just phenomenal. In this book, he referenced a clip that he said made the biggest difference in his life. And so I went to go find this clip, and uh, it's just, I couldn't cut it any other way. I couldn't reiterate what happens in the clip well enough for, for you to catch the gravity of it without you watching it. So I'm going to pray for us now, and then we're going to watch this clip together, and then we're going to pray together that we would always follow the voice of God. So let's pray this evening. I want you to open up your hearts just before we receive this media, that God will use it and anoint it, and that he would speak in it and through it, and that you would hear, you would have ears to hear. Jesus says, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Lord, I pray in your precious name that as we watch this media, as we receive your word tonight, that we would see what you're saying to us. We would see with all great clarity. Whatever holds the most clarity holds the most gravity. And so, God, we want to be clear about what you're asking us to do. Our next step, Lord, in our relationships, with our relationship with you, with, our, with regards to wherever we are in life, Lord, we pray in your precious name that you speak clearly. Tonight you speak mightily. And this would be a turning point evening in our journey with you. We love you, Jesus. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Watch the screen. Wasn't that encouraging? We would love to see you at one of our in-person services on Sunday at 8.45, 10.15 or 5 p.m. And if you'd like to know more about our church, visit us online at agabukeels.church. See you Sunday.